Recent archaeological discoveries in the People's Republic of China are changing America's concept of its own history. From ancient historical records, we hear of a Buddhist monk, Hu Shen, who by his own written account appears to have landed on the American continent in 458 AD. Did the trail they took lead them to Central America? Now, new discoveries off the coast of California may furnish proof that America was discovered by Chinese explorers over a thousand years before Columbus. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. The rocky coast of Cape Mendocino in Northern California is one of the places where some scientists believe Chinese explorers landed on our shores many years before Columbus. Larry Pearson, a marine archaeologist, searches beneath the seas for evidence of such voyages. Larry is one of the few respected scientists who believe there is an element of truth to be found in ancient Chinese tales. The Chinese memorialize their legends by staging historical pageants. One story tells of a skillful magician who, when sent on a secret journey by his emperor, Qi Shuang Di, returned with reports of a land far away, across a vast ocean. Presenting his report, he stated that it was a land of mighty rivers and mountains. Here, strange people dwelt whose gods granted them the gift of the elixir of life. He pleaded for this gift of immortality for his master, but it was denied him. He claimed it could only be parted with in exchange for rich gifts. A thousand noblemen and beautiful maidens were required, together with skilled craftsmen. Excited by the prospect of eternal life, the emperor gave leave to proceed. The magician gathered together a large group capable of starting a new colony. They built the necessary ships. The fleet set sail and was never heard from again. 10,000 miles away and 2,000 years later, Larry Pearson travels the coast of Northern California to investigate Indian legends. He hopes to find tales confirming contact between Asia and pre-Columbian America. His first stop is the American Indian Center at Humboldt University, where he consults with Indian expert Bobby Lake. The Pit River Indians and the Pomo Indian tribal group of northwestern California have an ancient myth or legend or folklore that talks about a giant bridge which went from this area across the ocean to another race of people who they felt or thought or believed were Indians, but their skin color was different. It was more yellowish. And the way the old legend goes is the world was purified by water and everything on earth was destroyed. And many of the high priests and religious leaders knew this was going to happen, so they gathered the people together and they moved up high to the high tops of the mountains. And while they were up there, some of the visionaries or prophets began to see another race of people who looked like Indians but were yellow-skinned. So somehow or another, you might call it mental telepathy, they started to build a bridge from this part of the continent while that other race of people started to build a bridge from the other continent. And somewhere in the middle of the ocean, they linked up together and they communicated with each other. And what really signaled all of this was the rainbow. As the yellow race of people left, and they were going back, a rainbow came up. And they said someday this physical bridge 
will be gone, but remember us, our brother, because the rainbow will always be there. Nearby, where the Klamath River meets the sea, Larry seeks further information from the local Indians. Florence Shaughnessy has lived beside the Klamath River all her life. We're called the Yurok people, but in Indian, we're called Pulik La. We are the people that walk by the ocean. To add to the evidence of Asian influence, there are legends of shipwrecks along the northwest coast. The story was that they found parts of Chinese uh, junk along the coast near Tillamook, Oregon. And so they, uh, they had the divers go down and they did find that it was old, old, old. So they figured that the Chinese came over, got caught in a storm, probably all perished or maybe some of them swam ashore. And they say that some of those uh, Chinese must have survived and then they went inland and uh, there was Indians, you know, living all around the coast there that they intermarried there because some of the uh, Indians from certain parts of uh, Oregon are slant-eyed and their skin is just a little different color than the, the bronze Indians. The Japanese current flows eastward along the 40th parallel, then merges with other currents and reaches the coast of California. There it splits, one half flowing north to Alaska, the other moving south along the coast of Mexico. At the division, a churning occurs which is so furious that many vessels riding upon it have been dashed to splinters. These rocky headlands, such as the point of land behind me, Trinidad Head, on the northern coast of California, are the kinds of obstructions seafarers traveling this coast would have encountered. These sites, of course, are historically known as very high hazard areas, graveyards of ships. It is just such a place on the coast that you'd expect to find the highest likelihood of the remains of ancient craft, particularly the Japanese and Chinese vessels that we know now have been here in pre-Columbian times. In response to a letter, Larry has come to examine these odd stones discovered by Dick Young, a fisherman who brought them up in his nets off Cape Mendocino. It is known that early Chinese seamen drilled holes in large stones and used them for ship anchors. Many similar stones have been found in Californian and Mexican waters, but most turn out to be naturally formed. In the case of these two, they're apparently formed in the deep ocean floor. These particular stones are natural. The nucleus could have been a whale bone, a whale vertebrae, but the shape of the hole, the ridges inside, uh, there is no taper here, there are subtle nuances in the hole itself to lead me to believe that they are indeed natural formations rather than being man-made. As a scientist, Larry is used to such setbacks. The real frustration is not occasional misleading evidence found along the shore but the fact that China lies across 7,000 miles of ocean. Further, China's doors have been closed until recently to Western scientists. On a recent trip to the People's Republic of China, the In Search of crew filming in a rural area found some large old stone rollers on a farm. We were interested to learn that these rollers had often been used as ship's anchors in early times. They are still used by some Chinese river boats today, ships of ancient design called junks. They are basically river vessels used by fishermen for centuries. In the famed Peking Museum, we found evidence that much larger seagoing junks once existed in the distant past. The skeleton of a giant sailing vessel has been uncovered. A fleet of ships of such size could have carried thousands of passengers. Remnants of this huge rudder indicate the ship was hundreds of feet long. A modern Chinese artist depicts how a fleet of these huge junks would have looked. Marco Polo told of long sea voyages made by the Chinese as they traded with such faraway places as India and Persia, 
but these were coastal trips. Could Chinese junks have survived long voyages in the open Pacific? To prove such a voyage possible, journalist Kuno Knobel and a group of fellow adventurers built a sailing junk as close as possible to ancient design. They named it the Tai Ki. Their plan, to catch the Japanese current to the North American coast, then southward to Central America. Despite calms and storms, all went reasonably well, until midway. They discovered the ship was under attack by thousands of sea worms, burrowing into the wood and undermining the hull. It was then that the typhoon hit. increasingly took on water, filling the hold. To stay afloat, the crew pumped frantically day and night in mountainous seas. Helpless when the rudder broke, they sent out an urgent message from their sputtering radio and waited. Their message had been heard. First, a Coast Guard plane from Juneau arrived, dropping supplies. Shortly thereafter, they were picked up by a freighter from which they watched their dream, the Tai Ki, lurch aimlessly away, lost over the horizon. In spite of shipworms and storms, they did pass the midpoint in their journey, proving that ancient junks were capable of lengthy voyages in the open sea. There are other discoveries which could prove that early Chinese explorers did complete such voyages a thousand years before Columbus. Christopher Columbus sailed across the Atlantic in his flagship, the Santa Maria, in 1492 and discovered America. Was Columbus the first? It is generally accepted that the Vikings, acknowledged to be daring seafarers, predated Columbus here. Many monuments still remain as possible proof of their settlements. Stone walls of Phoenician design found in New Hampshire indicate that they too might have been early visitors. This theory is strengthened by writings found at the site that some experts believe to be Phoenician. To argue who discovered America first is to ignore the fact it has been populated for hundreds of thousands of years. More important, we should examine what effects visitors from other lands have had on early Indian civilizations. About 1500 years ago, a sudden cultural surge occurred in Central America, which has mystified the world of archaeology for many years. Some believe this may have been brought about by contact from China. The Buddhist religion was flourishing in China in the 6th century. In a monastery in Shenxi province, these statues stand guard over the records of Buddhist history. We learned from these stone tablets that in 570 AD, several monks set sail across the Great Sea to seek new converts to the Buddhist faith. The official account of their voyage states that the monk Hu Shen and his companions sailing eastward came upon the shores of a strange faraway land. The distance logged was 20,000 leagues, or about 7,000 nautical miles. This would place them on the coast of Southern California. The account does not record their feelings as they cautiously entered a strange new land only that they made their way inland through forests, across mountains and deserts, for 350 miles. At last, 
they stood on the rim of a great canyon, banded with many colors. Could they have been describing the Grand Canyon? The account continues that at the bottom of the canyon, far below, there was a river winding among boulders. Making their way south, they crossed a great desert where the inhabitants ate the purple fruit of a strange tree they called the Fu Song tree. Was this a cactus? Finally, they came through dense jungles, arriving, some believe, in Central America, just prior to the great cultural flowering of the Mayan civilization. That the learned monk Hu Shen could have brought the Mayans advanced knowledge from China is discussed by Dr. James well, Moriarty of the University of San Diego. I hold with many archaeologists that uh, Central American and Mexican cultures, early ones, may very well have been influenced by some type of Asiatic contact. My reasons for this are uh, not unique, and they're found in the works of many who since the 1800s, late 1800s, have worked on these problems. During the Han Dynasty, a certain type of bull with certain kinds of feet was a, a prominent feature of that culture. You will find similar bulls in some Mexican cultures. Uh, you will find uh, jade work, which has been much discussed uh, uh, by some of my colleagues, which certainly shows Chinese influence and possibly even some pieces that are of Chinese origin. In China, we were permitted into the Forbidden City. The former imperial palace is now a museum housing special relics of the past. We were allowed to film the ancient jade soldier. The soldier's body, in burial, had been completely encased. It is significant that jade burial masks of the same period have been found in Mayan excavations. In China, we also filmed many serpent heads, only to find identical figures in Central America. The Mayans believed these serpents to be the representation of the man-god who brought them knowledge. Is it possible that this contact with Chinese culture accounts for the Mayans' remarkable knowledge of astronomy? Or mere coincidence that this Mayan calendar is similar to Chinese calendars of the period? In many Mayan museums, we found startling items there were never any elephants in America, yet this Mayan relief depicts one. The Mayan face had a distinctive shape, yet occasionally faces are found that appear to be Chinese. The Mayan god of happiness is unmistakably Chinese. The image of this bearded man continues to be a mystery. It is known that Indians do not have facial hair, who then was this oriental man found in Mayan excavations? Recent discoveries from the ocean floor may provide answers to some of these questions. It is fortunate that these divers off Redondo Beach, California were alert enough to recognize something unusual. Bob Maestrel and Wayne Baldwin have discovered what are believed to be Chinese stone anchors. We were out scuba diving one day, and uh, the water was dirty, and we started looking for other things other than lobsters. And I noticed this stone that had an indentation in it. And I started scraping the little rocks and shells off, and I noticed the hole got deeper and deeper and deeper, and so I lifted the stone up, and it had a perfect hole in it. Realizing that they may have found something unique, they decided to bring the stones to the surface for further examination. We found five more, raised them, and brought them into the shop. This large stone here that you see weighs over a thousand pounds. Uh, as we were raising it, it just broke the surface, and then itself broke in half and dropped to the bottom. 
Two questions must be asked regarding any of these possible anchors. First, are they from China? And second, how old are they? Of all the unusually shaped stones that have been found, there was only one example which was datable. That would be the stone found at the Patna Escarpment site. Samples were sent to Dr. Wang, who is a Chinese geologist. His analysis and comparative studies with known uh, uh, ancient quarries on the coast of China proved conclusively that the materials had come from China. The datability was in the form of a manganese concretion that had achieved a three millimeter thickness on this stone. The rule of thumb rate for manganese accretion is about a thousand years per millimeter, allowing a 50% error. This stone is still obviously pre-Columbian. It has been established to Larry Pearson's satisfaction that at least one of the stones is from China and is more than a thousand years old. However, he still seeks more definitive answers, answers that he believes will be found in the waters of the Pacific, proving the presence of Chinese explorers. The possible presence of Chinese explorers on our shores does not negate in any way the contribution made by Christopher Columbus. His is still the honor of founding the first continuing settlement of foreign visitors in the New World. Perhaps more important than who was first is the recognition of the valor of all those brave men who ventured into the unknown.